Chapter Three of the Adventures of a Nature Guide by Enos Mills. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It has been said of Louis Agassiz in his later American travels he would talk of glacial phenomena to the driver of a country stagecoach among the mountains, or to some workman splitting rock at the roadside, with as much earnestness as if he had been discussing problems with a brother geologist he would take the common fisherman into his scientific confidence telling him the intimate secrets of fish structure or fish embryology till the man in his turn became enthusiastic and began to pour out information from the stores of his own rough and untaught habits of observation agassiz's general faith in the susceptibility of the popular intelligence however untrained to the highest truths of nature was contagious and he created or developed that in which he believed chapter three winter mountaineering after a heavy snowfall one december morning i started on skis for two weeks camping in the colorado rockies the fluffy snow lay smooth and unbroken over the broken mountains. Here and there, black pine and spruce trees uplifted arrowheads and snow cones of the white mantle. On the steep slope, half a mile from my cabin, I was knocked to one side by a barrel mass of snow dropping upon me from a tree, and one ski escaped. As if glad to be off on an adventure of its own, it sped down the mountainside like a shot. It bumped into a low stump, skied high into the air and over a treetop, and then fell undamaged in the deep snow. Recovering my runaway ski, I started for the summit of the range, a distance of about nine miles from my cabin. For an hour, I followed a stream whose swift waters now and then splashed up through the broken icy skylights then leaving the canyon and skirting the slope i was on the plateau summit of the continental divide twelve thousand feet above the sea the summit moor was deeply overlaid with undrifted snow southward it extended mile after mile rising higher and higher into the sky in broken snow-covered peaks to the north, the few small broken cliffs and low buttes emphasized the trackless solitude. This plateau, or moorland, was less than one mile wide and comparatively smooth. Its edges descended precipitously 2,000 feet into cirques and canyons. Southward I traveled along the nearly level expanse of undrifted snow. Looking back along the line of my ski tracks, I saw a mountain lion leisurely cross from east to west. Apparently, she had come up out of the woods for mad play and slaughter among the unfortunate snowbound folk of the summit. She stopped at my tracks for an interested look, turned her head, and glanced back along the way I had come. Then her eyes appeared to follow my tracks to the boulder pile from behind which I was then looking. Playfully bouncing off the snow, she struck into my ski prints with one forepaw, lightly as a kitten. Then she dived into them, pretended to pick up something between her forepaws, reared, and with a swing tossed it into the air. Then her playful mood changed, and she started on across the divide. After several steps, she stopped looking back as if she had forgotten something, but was a little too lazy to retrace her steps. But finally she came back. She walked along my ski tracks for a few steps, then began to romp, now and then making a great leap forward, and rolled, and struck about with the pretense of worrying something she had captured. She repeated this pantomime a few times, and then, as if suddenly remembering her original plan of action, again walked westward. Arriving at the summit, she hesitated, and when I saw her last, 
she was calmly surveying the scenes far below on the mountain skyline i crossed a white tundra half expecting to see an eskimo peer from a snow mound arctic plants buried in the snow and ptarmigan eskimo chickens in their snow-white dress were the only signs of life later in the day i saw a white weasel slipping over the snow toward a number of the ptarmigan often on the summits the ptarmigan in leggings and coats of pure white watched me and allowed me to come and remain near they like the snowshoe rabbit skimmed over the surface on home-grown snowshoes possibly from them the eskimos got the idea of the webbed snowshoe which they have used for ages more than once when weathering gales where the thick insistent snow dust made me acquainted with the unpleasant sensations of strangulation i have envied the rosy finch and other birds of the snow who have a well-developed screen to keep choking snow dust out of the nostrils the eskimos also have a slotted wooden shield to protect the eye from the burning glare of reflected sunlight i descended a few hundred feet into the upper edge of the woods to find shelter for the night clearing out the snow between a cliff and a rock about six feet from it i had an excellent lodging place i built a roaring fire and heated a number of stones when this space was warmed i pushed the fire and the heated stones along the open space between the rock and the cliff then i started a fire against the base of the detached rock two huge sticks were placed at the bottom of this fire pile over these smaller ones were laid and at the top still smaller ones i set fire to this on the top so that it would burn slowly and not be at its hottest for an hour or two within the circle of warmth i placed my elk skin sleeping bag crawled into it and slept for nearly four hours when the cold awakened me i renewed both fires then had another short sleep when i again awoke i was ready for another day's adventure i set off through a forested slope that tilted gently toward the sun black shadows long and straight lay upon the forest floor the crowded pines were slender and limbless except at the top across an opening these slender shadows were at their best with the snow glistening in white lines between their deep black ones after two hours i came out upon a white and treeless meadow across which shadows were flying moving cloud shadows rushed across and the shadow of a soaring eagle appeared swiftly skating in circles over the snow i spent hours reading the news observing the illustrations and studying the hieroglyphics on the snow whether footprints in the mud or snow may have suggested printing cannot be told but it is certain that the tracks stains and impressions in snow print the news and record the local animal doings here the rabbits played there the grouse searched for dinner while over yonder the long lacy trail of a mouse ends significantly between the impressions of two wing feathers one sees a trail made by a long-legged animal and another by a fellow with a long body and short legs perhaps a weasel at one place near the foot of an old tree a squirrel had abandoned a cone and run home nearby was the trail of a porcupine who was well fed well protected and though dull-witted not at all afraid apparently he hadn't any idea where he was going and did not care whom he should meet for at one place he came face to face with a fox and the fox turned aside footprints often reveal the excitement hesitation change of plan and the preparation of two wild folks advancing and about to meet most animals except the grizzly 
though concerned with sight and scent, appear not to consider the impressions in the tell-tale snow. I passed again through woods, where, the previous winter, I had walked upon ten feet of snow. In that trip, I had looked down upon a camp bird, cuddled in an old nest. I talked to her for a minute, and, as is common with her kind, she came close, seeking something to eat. Three eggs were in the nest, though it was February. Never before had I found a bird nesting in the famine month of the year. These eggs may not have hatched, but another time I saw a nest of this species in March with eggs that did hatch. April is the nesting time for this bird. Why a pair sometimes nest unusually early is their secret. I found the crested jay that flings forth its jarring note as harsh and cold as frosty steel, using these mountains for winter quarters. A few of this species remain for the summer, but the majority nest further north. The water ouzel is a winter songster, and twice during this outing, in a snow-filled canyon, he sang to me cheerily. He may be seen and heard in any month of the year. This bird of quiet, cheering presence is an outdoor enthusiast. He was always delightfully busy and indifferent to my close approach if I came quietly and slowly. The scarlet berries and small shining green leaves of the kinnikinick gave color and charm to many snowy places. Half buried in the snow, in the sun or shadow, in niches of crags, or as wreath-like coverings for the rocks, they were bright and cheerful everywhere. I can imagine that the winter birds and animals worship the Chinook wind. One evening I went to sleep shivering. I was awakened through being too warm and leaped out of my sleeping bag, thinking it must be on fire. Then I discovered that in the night a Chinook had come. This warm, dry wind occasionally follows a blizzard, and often it appears to make a sudden and triumphant attack upon a cold period. During the short day or two that it dominates, it is a blessing. It often raises the temperature thirty or more degrees in a few hours. On another cold, windy night, I had a poor camp and damp clothes. I had examined the ice around a beaver house to see if it was built by a spring. It was, and I had broken through the thin ice. That night, as I shivered by a slow fire, I wished that I might have occupied a woodpecker's house. I took comfort in the fact that, at no time during the trip, would I be annoyed by flies and mosquitoes. From the sheltering edge of the woods, I watched the high wind stir and sweep the excited snow. The snowflakes had long since been reduced to powder and dust by colliding with cliffs and by being thrown violently against the earth. The wind was intermittent. A wave of snow dust swept along the snow-crusted earth, filling the air. Then a few seconds of sunshine played before the next wave followed. Occasionally everything cleared and stopped for an exhibit of the whirlwind. A towering white column of snow dust would spin across the scene. This commonly was followed by another and heavier spiral that was more like a confusion of white whirled clouds. All this time the sun was shining in a blue sky, and all this time, too, a sparkling pennant of diamond snow dust and powder a mile long was fluttering from the tip of a triangular peak. With such scenes in mind, the trees abloom with flakes, the white and sparkling whirlwinds, the vast and scintillating snow powder pennants, I could understand the poetic fancy of primitive people who happily named winter's gifts snow flowers and who honored the snow period with an outdoor celebration. After all, 
winter is but a transient return of the ice age with fresh falls on the heights above timberline before the wind blows the vast world appears overlaid with a permanent stratum of snow across white distances one looks for miles without seeing a tree or any living object or even a shadow unless it be that of a passing cloud though the high mountains have their snowstorms and their eternal snowfields in most mountain ranges the snowfall on the middle slopes of the mountains is heavier than upon the high plateaus and summits on the heights the wind has free play and sweeps most of the snow into enormous piles or drifts these are one hundred or more feet deep and sometimes cover nearly a square mile owing to their depth the low temperature of the heights and the fact that they are so densely packed these snow masses endure throughout the year wind is thus chiefly the factor in the making of snow topography small hills and plains canyons plateaus and mountain ranges all of snow are a constant source of interest one morning i awoke with dense white storm clouds all around me and the snow coming down wishing to camp that night at timberline i traveled up the mountainside in the thickly falling snow and dense clouds these clouds were drifting easily along the mountainside and together with the feathery flakes which they were shedding made it impossible to see distinctly even to the end of an extended arm suddenly i became aware of a diminished depth of snow underfoot i stooped to measure it it was less than three inches on rising i thrust my head through the silver lining the upper surface of the cloud into the sunshine the altitude was about eleven thousand feet above and about me the peaks and plateaus stood in gray and brown not a flake of all this snow had fallen upon them there was nothing to indicate that a storm had prevailed just below during the last two days and nights or that only a step down the mountain snow was still falling soundless and motionless the cloud sea lay below here and there an upthrusting pinnacle cast a shadow upon it unable to make myself believe that below me the flakes were falling thick and fast and that the ground was deeply covered with soft white snow i plunged down into the cloud after enjoying the novelty for a few minutes i climbed out of the snowstorm again and then once more descended into it as the mountainside was comparatively unbroken i walked along the upper edge of the cloud for some distance two or three times this fluffy mass swelled and rose slightly above me and then settled easily back in the head of a gulch cloud swells rose slightly higher than out in the main sea i climbed down into them a short distance thinking to cross the hidden canyon but finding it too steep walled climbed out again as i emerged from the gulch i saw nearby a huge grizzly bear sunning himself on a cliff that rose a few feet out of the cloud into the sunshine he like myself appeared greatly interested in the slow rise and fall and ragged outline of the storm cloud he was all attention to every new movement near him on scenting me he stared for a moment as if thinking where on earth did he come from then he stepped overboard into the clouds i camped that night beside a clump of storm battered trees that marked the upper limit of the forest in the morning all was clear the cloud sea of the day before had rolled silently away along the mountainside the ragged edge of snow stretched for miles above it barren rocky peaks rose in a great mountain desert below all was soft and white 
a wonderful world of mountains made of snowflakes. Near my camp was an ancient-looking tree clump. None of the trees was taller than my head, and though of almost normal form, they were somewhat gnarled and appeared as old as the hills. Centuries they surely had seen. Trees on the forest outpost in high mountains endure severe trials. They are dwarfed, battered, and broken, huddled behind boulders, buried or half buried in snow. The forest frontier is maintained by these brave tree people. Seen again and again, this region displays features of new interest as often as the visitor returns to it. On the heights I frequently saw conies. One day I lingered to watch one that was less shy than the majority. He sat with his back against the sunny side of a boulder, looking serious and keeping a careful survey of his field of vision. Presently I discovered his haystack, his supply of winter food, a tiny heap of grass, sedge, and alpine plants. It was about two feet high and was sheltered beneath two half-arching stones. Many were the ways in which I found animals spending the winter. In the course of this outing, I saw several flocks of mountain sheep. All these were in the heights above the tree line. On the day following the snow drifting one, I crossed the heights and on the summit passed close to a flock. They were feeding in a space that the wind had swept bare of snow. Happy highlanders they were, well fed and contented, in their home twelve thousand feet above the tides. One sunny, though cold, morning I came upon a large dead tree. In it were a number of woodpecker holes. Wondering if these houses had winter dwellers, I struck the tree with my hatchet. Instantly a dozen or more chickadees came pouring out of one of the holes like so many merry children. From a hole in the opposite side of the tree flew one or more birds that I did not see. Out of one of the upper holes a downy woodpecker thrust his head. Glaring down at me with one eye, impatient as late sleepers usually are when called, he appeared to be wanting to say, why am I disturbed? This is a cold morning. There are no early worms to be had in winter. From another hole flew another downy. I felt sure that none of these late sleepers had breakfasted. Seldom is an old woodpecker house without a tenant. Bluebirds, wrens, and numbers of weak-billed folk nest in them during the summer, while birds of other species find them lifesavers in the winter. A hummingbird's nest that I found brought to mind the fact that its builder, if alive, was then among the tropical flowers of Central America. Later in the day I saw a flock of chickadees, one or two brown creepers, and a solitary woodpecker, food hunting together. The chickadees kept up a cheering conversation, and twice I thought I heard the woodpecker give a call. I wondered if these fellow food hunters also all lodged in one many-roomed apartment house. Coming one day to a beaver pond, I scraped off the snow and looked through the clear ice into the water. Two or three beavers were swimming. The water between the ice and the bottom of the pond was about two feet deep. Each autumn the beavers pile ample winter supplies in deep water, close to the house. The pond may freeze over, but this ice covering is a protection. The house entrance is on the bottom of the pond, beneath the ice, and the floor is above the level of the pond. The water in the lower part of the house does not freeze. The beaver residents were here having a comfortable time, while deer in nearby woods were floundering in the snow. I have known deer to have a hard time of it in winter. Commonly deer winter in lower altitudes, but sometimes they stay in the middle mountain region and worry through the snowy weeks by yarding, that is, a number remaining in one small area where, through daily trampling, 
they keep on top of the snow and still find enough to eat a number of animals hibernate fat woodchucks live in a den five or six feet below the surface storms may come and go but the woodchuck sleeps till the first flowers wake the grizzly and the black bear spend from three to five months in heavy hibernating sleep plants too though anchored have a variety of winter customs trees may be said to hibernate even the firs and spruces that go to sleep in full dress beneath the snow are countless seeds that will live their life next year and numbers of plants that have hauled down their towers and colors for the winter you may seek them and walk over them and mother nature will only say trouble me not for the door is now shut and my children are with me in bed moss in midwinter is as fresh and charming as though knee-deep in june it is dainty and striking in a white setting mosses and lichens are ever a part of the poetry associated with ferns and the golden sands of bubbling springs they are sharers in the cheerful ever silent beauty of the wild they never intrude but are among the most subdued and harmonious decorations in all nature yet lichens carry all the colors of the rainbow in dark woods deep canyons and on the pinnacles of high peaks they cling in leafy map-like decorations of oxidized silver hammered brass pure copper and stains of yellow brown scarlet gray and green they are almost classical decorations and touch with soft color and beauty the roughest bark and boulders until one knows that they are living things they seem only chemical colorings of the crags and a part of the color scheme in the bark of trees one day during this outing i had been walking in the shadow of a mountain which together with the darkness of the spruce woods made the snow almost a gray expanse as i climbed out of the shadow onto a plateau just at sunset how splendidly dazzlingly white was the skyline of peaks on this white and broken line the sunset colored clouds strangely rested a sunset is never an old story and a colored sunset above the white west line of winter's silent earth renews the imagination of youth though i crossed a number of alpine lakes they were not to be seen they were gone from the landscape a stratum of marble instead of snow could not better have concealed them lakes flowers and bears were asleep for the winter in snowless places the brooks had decorated their ways with beautiful ice structures arches and arcades spires and frozen splashes and endless stretches and forms of silver streamside platings and boulder drapings ice crystal clear frosted and opaque many rocks were overspread with ice sheets and icy drapery and cliffs were decked with fretwork and stupendous icicles smaller streams froze to the bottom overflowed and outbuilt in places wide areas were covered to enormous depths looking upon these one might almost fancy the ice age returning but three months later the ice was gone to the far-off sea and the flowers that slept beneath were massing their brilliant blossoms in the sun an old ute chief once told me that during the hardest winter he had ever known in his country the snow for weeks lay six ponies deep. The average annual snowfall in the Rocky Mountains is less than 25 feet. This is less than the average for the Alps. Meetings with other human beings were few. One day, while walking down a plateau, I saw a dark figure that stood waiting on the edge of a snowy mountain moor a mile distant. As I approached, the man waved an arm to attract my attention, and when I came near enough, he said by way of greeting, I thought you had not seen me. 
we were above the limits of tree growth and below and about us was a wild array of peaks and canyons when i saw you coming racing down that peak shoulder said the man i fancied that you were an escaping siberian convict sentenced for political aims what is your sentence or your service they call me the snowman i replied i am making winter experiments and gathering information along the summit of the continental divide i had not as yet become official colorado snow observer in answer to a counter question of mine he said oh i'm a prospector fifty-four born in ireland raised in australia and siberia am after gold in spruce gulch if i don't strike it by spring i'm off for alaska stirring reports from there it was a good place to look around several towering peaks were strangely near a number of summits reached up fourteen thousand feet into the blue sky colorado is crowded with a vast and wondrous array of mountains many of these are united by narrow plateaus that are savagely side cut with deep canyons each time i gained a commanding height i looked again and again awed by the immensity of it all at peaks and canyons with their broken strata of snow the outing as usual was all too short ten of its fourteen days were sunny and calm through two days the wind roared two other days were filled with snowstorms each day i went to some new scene i climbed one fourteen thousand foot peak i occupied one camp three nights but on each of the other nights i had a new camp most of the nights were filled with stars and always there was a blazing campfire on my way home i met a man who had heard of my winter camping habits after questioning me concerning the objects of interest seen he asked is this a good time of year for a vacation i replied a good time for a vacation is whenever you can spare the time and the very best time for a vacation in the mountains is when you can stay the longest End of chapter 3